Welcome to this Medicine Masterclass in Radiology. In this lecture, we will be discussing relevant, important radiological cases involving chest images, abdominal images, both plain radiographs as well as CT scans and double contrast CTs as well. We will discuss some pertinent features, identify common foreign bodies that you may expect on uh, thoracic and abdominal imaging, and how to manage some of these conditions. Let's start by having a look at this normal chest radiograph. Start by determining the view. This is a standard postural anterior view where the patient is standing approximately six feet from the beam and the source is coming from the back of the patient through to the front. Next, determine the quality. Ensure the image is not rotated by comparing the positions of the left and right medial clavicular heads to ensure that they're equidistant from the spinous processes. Ensure that the inspiration is adequate by counting the posterior ribs and making sure that at least six anterior ribs are visible. Ensure that the penetration of the film is adequate and that the vertebrae behind the heart are barely visible and the diaphragm can be traced up until reaching the edge of the spine. Next, use a systematic approach to have a look at all of the various features on the chest x-ray. This is a mnemonic, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. A is airway. Inspect the trachea as well as its bifurcation, the airways starting at the APCs of the lungs all the way through to the basis. Assess the various bony structures, including the ribs, the spinous processes and any other bony structures that are available. Examine the heart, the cardiothoracic ratio, the cardiac shadow and the cardiovascular system. Assess the aortic knuckle and the aorta itself. Assess the diaphragm. The, the right hemidiaphragm is usually superior to the left due to the liver. Assess the edges of the film in particular looking for any signs of effusions, any extra thoracic soft tissues, any other densities, foreign bodies, whether there's an implantable loop decoder, whether there's any, pa any patient artifacts, any piercings, whether there's um, a pacemaker. Inspect the gastric bubble, the great vessels, ensure that there's no pneumoperitoneum. Examine the hyla, ensuring that there's no evidence of sarcoidosis or bilateral hyalolymphadenopathy, and this will allow you to create an overall impression. So this is a normal chest radiograph. You can see that the lung fields are clear, the trachea is nice and visible with a good bifurcation without any deviation, the film is not radiated, the spinous processes are found equidistant from the medial heads of the clavicles, and there's good inspiratory effort and good penetration. There's no obvious fractures uh, assessing the ribs both on the left and the right as well as the spine. The cardiac shadow is less than 50%, the cardiothoracic ratio is less than 50%, suggesting that there's no evidence of cardiomegaly. The gastric bubble does not appear to be enlarged, there's no evidence uh, of any diaphragmatic injury, there's an, there's an expected superior right hemidiaphragm compared to the left, and you notice that the hilum also appears normal. There's no, ovid, there's no evidence of effusions, consolidations, collapse, or pneumothorax all the way through to the apices of the lungs, and peripherally there's no evidence of surgical emphysema. Now have a look at this case. The striking abnormality is a meniscus sign in the right lung, and this is suggestive of a right pleural effusion. But also you noted that this patient has a hyper-expanded lung field owing to COPD. And you can see some chronic bronchopulmonary markings seen in both lung fields, particularly in the basal regions. There's early calcification of the aortic annulus, and this patient may also have a degree of aortic sclerosis. Interestingly, there's some mild scoliosis. We're now going to focus 
on the key findings of the next radiological cases. In this chest radiograph, you can see an, a right-sided meniscus sign indicating a right pleural effusion. But also, you can see that this patient's chest is hyperinflated as evidenced by more than six anterior ribs visible. This may indicate an underlying COPD. If you observe the aortic annulus, you can see early signs of calcification suggested, suggesting age-related calcification. There's also some early evidence of scoliosis and some loss of joint space between the spinal bones suggestive of osteoarthritis. But the key finding is a right pleural effusion. Have a look at this case, which is a more advanced effusion. On the left-hand side, you can see the meniscus sign rather high up, and there is some early pushing of the trachea towards the contralateral side, suggestive that there's more than a thousand mils of fluid. Now, have a look at this patient. This is an AP erect mobile film. An AP erect film would suggest that the patient was relatively unwell. And here the key finding is the sighting of a central line. And this is correctly sighted where the tip is just uh, superior to the right atrium. Have a look at this case. You can see that there is a mediastinal dilatation with a fluid level. And this is esophageal dilatation uh, with the presence of uh, fluid due to distal obstruction. This is a very important radiographic finding. You can see, if you look at the right hemidiaphragm, there is air under the diaphragm, and this is a case of pneumoperitoneum. This suggests that the patient has had a perforation of a viscous leading to the presence of pneumoperitoneum. And this patient would require emergency surgical management. They should be made nil by mouth. A CT scan would be required to determine the cause and they will be taken to theatre. This is a case of right middle zone consolidation, so low bar infection, um, and this patient would require intravenous antibiotics. This is a foreign body noted on the chest radiograph. You can see a dual chamber pacemaker and you can see the uh, the two chambers being innervated by this pacemaker that's sighted in the left subclavicular fossa. The next case, which looks rather abnormal and has this patchy uh, appearance, not only over the chest wall, but outside of the chest wall as well, this is a case of surgical emphysema causing pleural air to be trapped in the subcutaneous tissues. And this occurred as a result of an incorrect pleural drain being sighted. And if you palpate this uh, patient, you'll notice a very crispy texture to the skin, suggestive of subcutaneous emphysema. This next case demonstrates a large right-sided tension pneumothorax. And you can see the displacement of the mediastinum towards the left-hand side. The trachea has shifted, the mediastinum has shifted, and the heart has shifted. Now, a tension pneumothorax is a clinical diagnosis that even before a chest radiograph is taken should uh, have needle decompression as a life-saving measure. So technically speaking, a radiograph like this should not really be visible. Now you can see that um, a chest drain has been inserted. You can see that the tension has now been uh, released. The mediastinum has now shifted back into its normal position. And you can see very early reinflation of the right lung. If we take that a bit further, you can see further resolution and uh, here almost complete resolution of that same pneumothorax. Remember that pneumothoraces uh, are a collection of gas in the pleural space resulting in variable amount of lung collapse on the affected side. Spontaneous pneumothoraces occur in the absence of trauma. Primary spontaneous pneumothoraces occur in people with no underlying lung disease. And secondary pneumothoraces occur in patients with pre-existing lung parenchymal or pleural pathology. Uh, that includes patients with asthma, COPD, emphysema, sarcoid, Ehlers-Danlos, cystic fibrosis or any other re respiratory condition. 
patients would present with chest pain, they would be tachycardic, tachypneic, have reduced breath sounds on the affected side, reduced chest expansion and hyperresonance on the affected side, and tactile uh, and vocal uh, tactile resonance and vocal fremitus would be reduced on the affected side. The chest radiograph, uh, the, the pneumothorax should be measured from the hilum to the periphery, the distance from the lung edge to the thoracic wall, and anything more than two centimeters is classified, anything less than two centimeters is classified as a small pneumothorax. And these are the British Thoracic Society guidelines on how to manage pneumothoraces. Any, any pneumothorax, any, any pneumothorax which causes hemodynamic compromise requires a chest strain, or bilateral pneumothoraces should be managed with a chest strain. Otherwise, pneumothoraces are categorized as left-sided, as primary or secondary. Primary are those which occur in the absence of smoking history, absence of lung disease in young patients less than 50. And if they're small and asymptomatic, less than two centimeters, they can be managed conservatively and discharged and monitored in an outpatient setting. If a primary pneumothorax is more than two centimeters, they undergo needle aspiration. And if that's successful, they can be discharged. If not, they undergo chest drain insertion. If the pneumothorax is secondary, i.e. in a patient over 50, or the significant smoking or respiratory disease, then the patient should be admitted at least for observation, even if the pneumothorax is small and asymptomatic. But if, this, if the pneumothorax is more than two centimeters in a secondary pneumothorax, that should undergo chest strain insertion. If the pneumothorax is small, between one to two centimeters, then needle decompression can be attempted. And even if it's successful, the patient should still remain for at least 24 hours of observation. Let's move on to the next case. This patient presented with left shoulder pain and the left shoulder radiograph was taken. But what I want you to focus on is not the shoulder, but actually what was picked up in the left lung field. So you've got this uh, image, the whole image belongs to you, not just the clinical picture. And you can see a large lung mass that was picked up incidentally. And this is the complete chest radiograph, which demonstrates a large lung lesion um, in the superior left thorax. This patient uh, then went on to have a CT scan and you can see how large that tumour is invading the thoracic cavity. They went on to have a staging CT and they also had cerebral uh, metastases and you can see that metastatic deposit, quite a large metastatic deposit in the right hand side of the brain causing a mass effect compressing the ventricles and there is some vasogenic edema as well. Here's another thorax. Uh, uh, here's another chest radiograph. And what you can see here are some large bully in the left and right apical zones. And this is bilateral bullous disease. And patients who have, cis who have COPD with enlarged bully may require lung volume reduction surgery or bullectomy. And this can be done through a VATS procedure. Have a look at this case. This is very important. We're looking at the foreign body here, which is the nasogastric tube. And it's a mandatory requirement to ensure that these images have senior reviews, because if a NG tube is sighted in the wrong place, i.e. ends up in the lungs, it can cause a serious pneumonia, which can result in morbidity and mortality. So it's important you know the characteristics of a correctly sighted NG tube. The NG tube should bisect the carina, bisect the diaphragm, and end up in the, uh, in the stomach. You can aspirate the content to determine the pH, uh, but a chest radiograph is very important. And you can see, uh, the, you can trace the entire NG tube there, and that's just been visualized for you. Here is uh, an incorrect NG tube placement. You can see that the NG tube just tracks straight in to the right main bronchus and that should not be used, it should be removed immediately and most likely it would be causing uh, the, pain, the patient a lot of discomfort and coughing. But you might, you might have a, a sedated patient where you can't detect those clinical signs and that's why the radiograph is very important. Uh, this is another case of an incorrectly sighted NG tube. This one has gone into the left main bronchus. Here is uh, an NG tube that unfortunately passed into the right bronchus, curved in the right bronchus, and then passed into the left bronchus. Again, very unsafe, 
and needs to be removed. Um, and here is another one. So there are a lot of these to demonstrate how easy it is for the NG tube to be cited in the wrong place um, and how important it is to have a senior review of these NG tubes prior to feeding. And again, incidentally, you can see this patient has age-related aortic calcification. Uh, another interesting uh, image, this is an NG tube that had curled up in the oropharynx. Sometimes this does happen when it's very difficult to pass through uh, and it can just the NG tube can just curl up and of course that can't be used as well. This is uh, an interesting foreign body. It looks like a USB pen in the breast pocket, but actually this is what an implantable loop recorder device looks like on a radiograph. So this is a device that's implanted in the patient and this records the patient's beat to beat heart, uh, ECG tracing for, uh, for a very long period of time. You can record for months on end and this allows you to determine whether there are subtle arrhythmias. This is particularly a useful device when you're investigating patients with cryptogenic strokes, those strokes where you can't determine a reason why they're having uh, a stroke and you can just see that foreign body sitting there and that's an ILR. Uh, this, uh, this image, a barium swallow, demonstrates, you can see the contrast there and you can see the bird beaking of the esophagus at the very end, that tapering of the esophagus, and this is known as achalasia. And here is another more detailed image of achalasia and that's described as a bird beak appearance um, and you can see that this would cause the patient severe dysphagia and require esophageal dilatation or surgical intervention. Have a look at this chest radiograph. Again, there are a number of foreign bodies that you can see here, but I want you to see these uh, ring-like metallic structures. This is, uh, these are post-cardiothoracic surgical uh, wires. These are stenotomy wires, which are keeping the, um, the sternum together. And you can also see that the patients had some spinal surgery, and you can see the spinal rods there and this patient also has an NG tube in situ. So again, quite a good radiograph demonstrating an array of foreign bodies. You may be asked to see a patient with abdominal pain and you organize a, an abdominal radiograph. And what you can see here is large bowel obstruction. So in the large bowel, there are house tray, which are non-continuous lines, and this peripherally dilated large bowel is as a result of a proximal obstruction. Compare that to where the lines are seen going all the way across. Uh, this is small bowel obstruction. Have a look at this. This is a barium enema given to a patient. And what you can see is a complete loss of architecture along the transverse colon and the descending colon. And this is seen in conditions such as inflammatory bowel disease. This is a double contrast enema. The one contrast is air and the second contrast is barium. And you can see this beautiful 3D uh, light, uh, light up of the colon. And this, this, uh, these outpouchings that you can see where the contrast is aggregated is suggestive of diverticulosis. And here is a post-mortem specimen of multiple diverticulae. Here's another double contrast CT and what you can see is as the ascending colon ascends there is a lesion in the middle which looks like an apple core and this is called an apple core lesion and it's suggestive of um, a mural cancer, uh, a bowel cancer. This is an, again an abdominal film but there is uh, a foreign body. This is known as a trouser graft and this is seen uh, to repair aortic aneurysms. And if you look very carefully at the distal end, you can see the original aorta calcified and aneurysmally dilated, and it's been treated with this um, aortic aneurysm repair by the vascular surgeons. Here, another foreign body in, a, in an abdominal film. This is uh, a a stent, an esophag a, a, a stent in the intestine, and this would be used as a palliative measure for a patient who's becoming recurrently obstructive as a result of a cancer, just to help the transit of the colon. 
Another foreign body in an abdominal film, this is known as a JJ stent, and this is in the left uh, kidney, extending all the way through to the bladder, passing through the ureter to uh, overcome an obstruction. You can see if you compare uh, the kidneys, both kidneys look injected and you can just about make out their outlines. And this is hydronephrosis. So perhaps this patient had a stone more marked on the left hand side, which caused back pressure and acute kidney obstruction. A JJ stent was cited to allow the kidney to flow freely out of the kidney through the ureters into the bladder, relieving that uh, obstruction allowing the kidney function to improve. And if you look very closely at the distal end of this uh, JJ stent, you can see a very small ureteric calculus. And there's just a, a, a zoomed up diagram there. Uh, this case uh, is there for uh, interest. You can see that at the peripheries of the ribs, it looks rather abnormal, but this is just age-related chondrocalcinosis. It's a normal finding in the elderly. This is an interesting um, image. This certainly is the thoracic cavity because you can see the ribs, you can see the left uh, lung field uh, and just a small portion of the right lung field. But this middle connection, this esophageal connection, looks like the colon. And actually this is a colonic anastomosis uh, serving as a surrogate esophagus. So I hope you've enjoyed all of those cases. There are some very important foreign bodies that we had a look at, their role. We had a look at some, some very acute cases such as bowel obstruction, pneumothoraces, discussed their management, as well as the approach to a normal chest radiograph. Thank you very much for joining us in this Medicine Masterclass.